we want you to sort of share your opinions and feel free to do that. And um, so just tell us your name and, and how you want to have it spelled out, your title. Okay, Charles Trimble, retired, and uh, I'm uh, a member of the Oglala Lakota tribe and uh, served through pretty much the 1970s as uh, director of the National Congress of American Indians. And prior to that, when I first met Lucy, uh, I was, uh, uh, I, I found, I was the founder of the American Indian Press Association at that time. That was in 1969 or 70. And that was an interesting time because that's when I first met Lucy. It was, uh, <clears throat> I really wasn't involved in Indian affairs very much. I was in aerospace industry and stuff. And uh, uh, I was the editor of uh, a little newspaper called the Indian Times in Denver. And uh, Oh, was in touch with a lot of other Indian editors of Indian newspapers because we, we would exchange, uh, you know, uh, subscriptions. And uh, so we decided to start the American Indian Press Association, and I went to uh, uh, NCAI convention and in uh, Anchorage, and uh, I got to make a short presentation on what we were trying to do with the new American Indian Press Association. And Lucy came and she said uh, that she was interested in what I was talking about, and she says, I want you to come up to Spokane because I want to talk to you. <laughs> you know, just like that. I I loved it, and uh, then later on, she I think she called, and uh, she said, you're supposed to come up to Spokane. I said, oh, okay, well, you know, and I expected her to offer a ticket, but she never did. <laughs> so I flew up there on my own expense, <laughs> and uh, she met me in Spokane, and we, uh, went to the Indian Center there, and she was, told me exactly what she wanted. And uh, she described it that she wanted two hands holding the reservation. And that was to depict the fact that it's in your hand. Only you can do it. You, you know, nobody else can do it. So it's up to you. And so that's where the logo for our heritage came about. And she wanted the paper named Our Heritage. And she really had uh, pretty much down what she wanted. And uh, articles, and I think Vine Deloria wrote one of the first articles, you know, big article and it was a, a newsletter as I recall it was it wasn't full-size newspaper and which uh, she was so specific and uh, I liked her right away she uh, never ever offered to pay me anything and but I got to know that she didn't have the money to pay me anyway, you know. So, you know, you do it free. <laughs> and uh, and I got my father-in-law involved with his uh, ad agency here in Omaha. And uh, we were able to put our heritage together and uh, publish it. And, send it out to her, and she 
and start mailing those out to uh, tribal members in Seattle and Portland and Spokane, mostly, you know, to get them to vote. And uh, that was, was that when she was running that campaign to uh, replace that pro, it was strange, you didn't call it pro-termination, pro-liquidation. They were the liquidationists. And when I first went up there, uh, she didn't want me to go out to one of the <clears throat> rallies that was ha they were having. She said it was too dangerous. We don't want anything to happen to you. And, and at that rally, I didn't go to it. But somebody ran a herd of cattle through the rally. <laughs> <laughs> Scattered everybody. But, oh... That was my first meeting with Lucy, and she just kind of captures you, you know. She, and that's what she did. There, there was a group later on, and I was part of it. Melton Askett was part of it, and there were others. They called us Lucy's Litter, and, <laughs> and I was kind of proud of that, you know. So that must have been the Committee on Indian Rights, sort of Lucy's litter. The what? The Committee on Indian Rights. Do you remember that? I don't remember that, no. Okay, I think that's what they, they called themselves. Um, but um, So what, what did termination mean to you at the time? At that time, I was also close friend to another woman that uh, I had met uh older woman named Helen Peterson. And Helen was also a very inspiring leader. And uh, uh, but uh, Helen t told me pretty much about termination. She was executive director of the National Congress in the 1960s and uh, at the end of the 1950s uh, when termination was first kick again. And uh, Joe Gary was the president of the uh, NCAI and Helen Peterson was the executive director. And so she had a very strong knowledge of what uh, termination was doing and what the federal government meant to do through termination. And that was to sever the relationship between the Indian tribes and the federal government. So there would be, be no more trust relationship. And... Uh, it was kind of it was a, it was a scary thing because a lot of those tribes weren't ready for that, or you know even today. And why should they be? You know that that's something that 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 was their right as much as anybody. You know that trust relationship was something. It wasn't a gift to them. It was an agreement. And. Uh, So that, that, that is what I understood termination to be. And I think uh, that was important because up there in uh, Colville, a lot of the tribal members thought it was just a matter of ownership of land, that uh, th this was all going to be bought from you and you'll be free with a whole bunch of money. And that wasn't it at all. You know, that that land base was so important that without that land base, you really didn't have a tribe anymore. And so that was, uh, you know, what, what I was, what I had learned from 
Helen and also from Lucy. And uh, and that determination must be fought. It must be taken on. And Lucy was the one to do it, you know, to uh, go up there and uh, defeat the liquidationists and uh, take back the tribe and instill those values, you know, instill that knowledge uh, of, you know, of what that really meant to them. And uh, those two women were so powerful. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, so many of the women I met in uh, our leaders in NCAI were women. And I noticed they're They worked well behind the scenes, not subversively or uh, covertly, but they did the work in the committees. You know, they were always down there with the, uh, you know, the uh, resolutions committee and all of these committees, those are the caucuses and committees that make NCAI work. And there, were, there was an understanding among women on that. And uh, I always really appreciated it because that's where I met so many inspiring leaders and so many of them were women. <laughs> seen um, you know some of the videos that were done of Lucy at the time we, there's one that's done by the Encyclopedia Britannica uh -huh. were you involved in that no okay um, and I was curious about the our heritage newsletter when when you put that together how many copies or how many editions did you do how, how long did that period last the what? The, when you were helping with the editing the Our Heritage newsletter, how? Uh, uh, she took over pretty quickly, or they did up there. And I think that uh, we did the initial and maybe a couple more. But uh, she took the responsibility up there. So. Okay. So and I don't know uh, uh, who published it or anything, but... I know we're, we're sort of trying to see if we can get a copy of each of those. So whatever you make available would be really... I have a file. Uh, I look through my files, which are a mess, uh, before you came, because I thought I could put my hands on it. I also uh, loaned that, all that material to Mark Trant, and uh, he was very interested in Lucy and, and everything. Well, I, can, I can check in with Mark. I know he, he, he suggested I get a hold of the University of Arkansas, and that's how I found out. Oh, good, yeah. The copy that I have. Yeah. I'll, I'll look through, and okay. uh, I'll also check the, uh, my... Uh, the University of South Dakota asked for my papers. And so a lot of them are in their, in their archives up at the University of South Dakota. And you can call them and just ask for the uh, Charles Trimble ar uh, archives. And and they have them pretty well organized. And uh, they may have the whole thing on. Okay. Sounds good. So, um... I know that um, you worked with other members of the Colville tribe. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? I worked with? You had worked with other members of the Colville tribe. You, I know you had mentioned Melton Asket and, yeah. and um, my father. Yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I uh, 
Well, for, initially, you know, when when uh, they were part of the team that Lucy was trying to get back on the council or get on onto the council, and uh, that's where I, I met them. But I didn't uh, really work closely with them. I worked uh, directly with Lucy on those things. And so that that interaction, how long did that last? Well, a lot of them, well, Mel Tanaskit lasted a long time because he and I worked so closely at uh, NCAI. He was the president and I was the executive director. And uh, Andy Joseph, I, I uh, you know, read later on, periodically. Uh, oh, I can't remember the others. Desatel, I never uh, met again, I didn't think, but uh, I, you know, it was mostly directly with uh, Lucy that I that I worked. Well, I I know when we've like, talked with Rachel Joseph and with um, Veronica Murdoch. Oh yeah. They would talk about how Lucy, um, you know, would um, meet with them after the committee meetings, or they would they would get together and they would and she would. She would tell them that she wanted them to do certain things. Yeah. And so she would propose some strategy, but they'd sort of figure it out. It's kind of like you said, they use the committee process and the caucus process. Yeah. She was so well respected that she could do things like that, you know, and uh, she was living, walking hero, you know, among a lot of the people, and uh, among younger people, uh, a, a tremendous inspiration. Uh, you know, just even today, you know, when I uh, uh, talk around and talk about the old days and people like that, and I mentioned Lucy Covington and, you know, the, uh, the eyes light up, or, you know, the name is recognized. And uh, with such admiration. Well, when you were, cause, because you were executive director, did you um, arrange meetings on Capitol Hill for Lucy or for others? We, we did whenever we were asked to. Uh, a lot of the tribes had their own lobbyists. And uh, NCAI, they... Uh, I would have to say that I didn't consider myself a good lobbyist. Uh, but NCAI was important in pulling together consensus among the tribes. That was their major value. And so after uh, let's say, Helen Peterson's days, you know, and beyond that, uh, they really, they were set up as a lobbyist organization. But uh, I don't think that they were extremely effective as a lobbyist group. They, they did try to, uh, you know, uh, arrange presentations to Congress and to the administration and everything, and did a good job at that, but uh, uh, for individual lobbying, no. Okay. Well, how about, um, do you have any stories about Lucy at that time, um, about her interactions with members of Congress? Or? Yes, uh, Scoop Jackson, <laughs> I don't know, you know, he, he was pushing termination and uh, I always felt she kind of won them over, you know. I don't think there was uh, 
warfare, political warfare between them or among them. And, uh, and I think that there was a lot of respect for her on the part of uh, members of Congress and including Scoop Jackson and uh, Lloyd Meads and other uh, people from the Northwest and, and uh, throughout the Congress, she was pretty much recognized. And... I've, I've heard, um, I, when I worked on Capitol Hill, one of the first members I met was, um, who, knew, who, had, who had knew her and worked with her was Nor Norm Dix from yeah. Washington State. And he had met her when he worked for Senator Magnuson. Oh yeah, Magnuson. Yeah. I forgot about him, yeah. Said that that um, Warren Magnuson would send like his like a limousine or a vehicle to pick her up when he knew she was coming into the airport. So oh, uh, they, they would sort of ride around town in that limo limousine and stuff because he wanted her to you know sort of they, uh, they'd visit and chat. So they they meet up like at the Mayflower Hotel and you know just sort of hang out and probably have their martinis. Yeah. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> yeah. So they had good times. Um, did, um, did, did you have any involvement in helping craft the Self-Determination Act? Or, you know, I know that there was a lot happening with the um, task force in, on, you know, tribal, what was it, the, um, the, the movements, you know, there was sort of like an examination of trust responsibility. Yeah, what the, the policy review commission? American the AP. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, uh, those task force were uh, pretty well arranged uh, politically, and uh, you know, with uh, with a lot of polit politics going on. But, it was uh, <clears throat> kind of an honor, you know, to uh, be appointed to that, and so there was a lot of political activity. But uh, we didn't have an awful lot to do with uh, putting those together. You know, that was. was that something that Forrest Gerard had? Yeah, Forrest uh, did an awful lot, and Franklin Duchesneau on the outside. I see. Yeah, I, I. I've only sort of read sort of what, what took place. I didn't really know who was all involved in putting it all together. Yeah. So, but I, I would anticipate if NCAI was, you know, out there that you guys were very involved in helping to at least shape the recommendations. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, it was very important to have the right people on there. It got pretty uh, political, too, <laughs> you know, the, but uh, it... It was good politics. It was, uh, you know, the right people got on in most cases. And I think Ernie Stevens did an awfully good job, uh, you know, heading it up. Mm -hmm. I, I remember Ernie Stevens and um, Leon Cook were some of the individuals that Lucy would bring in to also help with the cam campaign against termination. Uh -huh. So, because I, I remember they were, I think, both around this field and a couple of the different meetings that took yeah. place. So, um, anyway, we're um, curious about, you know, sort of, I, I've seen testimony of Lucy on the Self-Determination Act, and I was wondering if you were involved in, in helping. Yes, so. I think, in my mind, it was such a good act, you know, uh, to basically let the tribes take over and let the federal government 
pay the tribes on a contract basis to do their own governance and to take a lot of the uh, power away from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, you know, on the reservations. And uh, it, it, I thought that was, you know, it's something I, when I first went to NCAI, I never expected to see, you know, that all of a sudden this thing was shaping and uh, a lot of people sh shaped it, you know. But again, there, Forrest Gerard and, and, and people like that had an awful lot to do with it. And uh, I think uh, the Policy Review Commission, American Indian Policy Review Commission, that's what it was at okay. the big city. and. Uh, a lot of that came out of there. Well, I know the, um, when I've seen the testimony, um, Lucy had you know, been very clear about you know, that we're not asking for more than anybody else. We're just asking for what's due to us. Right. And we're just you know, trying to do what we can to address the education and development of our community. Right. So, um, and, and I'll shift a little bit towards that discussion around the American Indian scholarships and what that was about. But um, I, I know she, she didn't have children of her own, so she was, um, it's sort of, she felt like everybody was her child, yeah. that she was responsible for everyone. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I served with, uh, Lucy on that uh, American in, or the uh, uh, scholarship committee. John Rayner put that uh, away, and of course he had such high respect for her. And uh, he asked it. Uh, he invited myself and uh, Lucy and him, and I can't remember the other ones. A couple were jo Joe Sando. And uh, just a really good group of, a small group of people. And I think we were uh, taking over the distribution of about a million dollars in scholarships that uh, were going out to uh, help graduate students, Indian graduate students. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that was another, you know, John Rayner was a, a strong leader himself down at the Taos Pueblo. Mm -hmm. And the respect that he had for Lucy, you know, it just seemed like, you know, if, she, if he was going to create that uh, American Scholarship Fund, or scholarship service, uh, that she would be on it. And you, you saw that all across Indian country, mm -hmm. you know, with uh, uh, all of those leaders, all the, you know, it was just, uh, she came to mind uh, whenever something like that was coming up because they, there was such great widespread respect for her. Yeah. Well, um, Chuck, I don't know if you know, but they're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the American Indian Graduate Center now. Yeah. And have they been in touch with you? Uh, no. I, I suspect they'll probably be reaching out to you sometime. Oh, okay, future. yeah. That'd be uh, nice. Would... We actually interviewed the, uh, their executive director, Angelique Albert, during NCAI. Uh -huh. And um, they have been awarding $15 million in scholarships a year. And they have said since they started in, in, um, in, in 1969, 1970, in that period of time, that they've awarded, I think, 16,000 plus scholarships. Uh -huh. So they're, um, they, they have like a, a discrete number of, 
of lawyers and physicians that they know that they've awarded scholarships to. Uh -huh. I know myself, I'm a scholarship recipient of them. Who are you? Yeah. Oh, wonderful. So um, I was able to go to graduate school at the University of Denver you know, because of that. But, um, so they went back and they've been, they've been looking, they're trying to get pictures of Lucy and the early board. Oh. So they'll probably highlight some of that. Yeah. In Joe Sando, I think few of us are alive. I may be the only one alive from that original group. Yeah, it, it might be. Yeah. It, it might be. Um, I think Howard, Howard, or John Rayner's son, Howard, is sort of helping them out. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, a few others. I yeah. Think that's where um, Sam Deloria and, and um, others have been involved. Yeah. Um, are you, um, do you re have any particular recollection of Lucy's comments or her thoughts or her concerns during that time on the board? Do you remember anything that stands out from your earliest meetings? I'm thinking... I'm trying to re-picture her in meetings and, you know, how she conducted herself. And it was always with enthusiasm, uh, with dedication. And it was just a, a feeling, you know, uh, that she added to the group of her dedication, her interest, you know, how important it was to her. Uh, I don't remember any specific thing that she said, but it was always encouraging. She wasn't one to gripe, you know. If she had something to tell you, she would tell you, you know, <laughs> not be on your back. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I just can't think of anything, but you know, interesting question. You just, you know, see her, you kind of feel her spirit or something, even thinking of it now, yeah. you know, just really trying to think of what, uh, what it was, what, what did she bring, what, uh, and it was always important. She was one of my first heroes in, in NCAI and, all of those. Yeah. Well, I, I understood that she went to Haskell, and um, so I've met with the archivist from Haskell, and she's going back and trying to, to look at her records. Oh, yeah. And talk a little bit more about her time in Haskell. And I, we're thinking it's probably in the 30s uh -huh. that she was there. And I know she was involved in the war effort, and that's when she met her husband, John. So. Lucy nurture you and your leadership skills. Pardon? Did Lucy nurture you and your leadership skills? Was she helping you to become a better leader? And that's what Melton Askett says. I think uh, constantly challenging. Yeah. And I think if Mel were... Uh, Mel is still alive, isn't he? Oh, okay. He just got a moose. Huh? He, he and his son both went out. They had permits for moose, oh. and they each got a moose. So he's still out there hunting and being active. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Did you have to push this button? Yeah, we're wrong. Okay, good. Okay, yeah. That's um, my, she's like my, my best friend is my cousin, Joey. 
and she's on the gaming commission. She's their secretary, so she schedules Mel all the time. So she's always got almost like daily um, connection with him. So, but I knew he went out to get a moose. They were interviewing Joy Sundberg, and we were all wondering if he was successful. And by that Sunday night, their friends were posting pictures of his his moose looked smaller than his son's moose. <laughs> you know, moose are kind of kind of hard to come by, so the fact that they got each got a moose was pretty amazing. <laughs> well. So, but anyway, he's doing good. But he talks when he talks about Lucy. Um, it was really nice. I, the, one of the first times I was working in Washington, then Mel took me out to dinner at the um, Phillips flagship. And, you know, oh, yeah. The wharf. And he was sort of saying, he says, I wanted you to have the same experience that I had with Lucy, but she brought me here. He says, when she came to D.C., she liked to eat dinner here. And he says, so I wanted to bring you here and have dinner. Oh, that's nice. And so he told me about how one of the first times he went to Washington, she, she just told him to bring a notebook and a notepad. And, and he, she, he just followed her all around D.C. And he said, he told her, she told him to take notes of the, all the meetings and all the conversations. And then she says, and so at the end of the day, we're going to get together at dinner and we'll talk about you know what your impressions were oh wow so he said that's how he learned how to deal with all these different members of congress and um he would go over the notes with her and then she'd tell him what he had to do next so he just he was like the secretary he says i was like her glorified secretary but he said i'd, I'd go everywhere and he says, but i learned how to understand and she told me what she thought and he said it was really helpful in understanding how to deal with He was sort of kind of passing it on to me, and I said, well, yeah, of course, I have to take notes of all the meetings and things like that, too. Yeah. So, but it was good. So, um, I know you've served with her on that board of uh, scholarships. Um, did, was there ever any, any advice or any suggestions she had about cultural identity? Like, you know, about how to be students should feel pride for who they are or, you know, that they <coughs> should be, understand who they're descended from and who their family connections are. Did she ever talk with you about that? No. Okay. Because um, I've seen her, you know, offer comments in some of her videotapes where she talks about the importance of our identity. Oh, okay. And, and I think she was really worried in termination that that if if we weren't if we lost our land, we'd lose our identity, and that we would yes. lose our sense of who we were. So I was curious. If yes, you... yes, I remember. <laughs> You're photographing. You come. No, oh. She's watching. So, um, so do you think tribal sovereignty plays a role in the education of our children? Does it play a what? Does it play a role? Is there, or, or, I guess, how do you feel about young people today? You know, because part of this Lucy Covington Center is to try to help to try to help transfer and and give all these young college students that attend Eastern Washington University a, a person like you said she was a hero to you um, but we're, we're trying to help them I think on a larger basis understand how these leaders these elected tribal leaders are an important part of what their future holds Yeah, you mentioned sovereignty. I think, you know, that word is used so much. 
I don't think it's overused, you know, it's, it's a fact. But uh, sovereignty, is uh we we have it it's 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 not something they could take be taken from you you know it's a uh, it's yours uh they can quit recognizing your sovereignty and that's what they mean to do or you know in termination and stuff but they don't take it away from you. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, I, she probably, she understood that, I guess. Well, I'm, I'm just, um, I know, Chuck, I've, I've read where you've, um, you've, ri you've written about the kids at, I think it's at Red Cloud Indian School, and, um, yeah. You've talked about the importance of their, you know, sort of having a good sense of their identity and where they come from and who they are and sort of the greatness of the, of the people, you know, that it's sort of intrinsic to them. But sometimes I think they have a hard time finding that or identifying that. Yeah. So I think that that's, to me, that was a part of um, the importance of Lucy was that she she knew that and she was trying to always figure out ways to protect that and promote that um, she always felt it was important you know participate in the powwow or the dance yes yes uh -huh. so do, I, do, you, do you have any ideas about that you know all that uh Indian country meant, you know, to her, and especially the land base. And, and the identity. But, you know, Colvilles are not just Colvilles, are they? They're, uh, what was she? She was Moses. Oh, okay, yeah. We're not she and Caius. Okay. But, yeah, she... Well, I just... Like a cloud or something, you came into Lucy's world and you were... You know, that it's a spirituality and it's, it's a whole bunch of, of things that she recognized and that you had to recognize in order to fight for termination or fight against termination. And uh, because those were being threatened and she stopped termination. Aided ear turned it around, <laughs> but Lucy stopped it. Yeah, I, I agree. I think when you talked about the Our Heritage newsletter, pardon? When you talked about the Our Heritage newsletter, yeah, um, you talked about that um, she wanted to have the hands wrapped around the yeah. The sort of the reservation and the land, and um, she was trying to protect that for her, for the children and for future generations. Uh, yeah, she was very clear on what she wanted. All I did was illustrate what she wanted, and uh, I remember some of those first articles. And I think Vine wrote one for her on the value of the land. You know that. Uh, if it's sold, it's sold at estate prices, you know, estate sale, because you're not going to get the value, you know, and that's what people
people were looking at, you know, well, a lot of money's coming in. But uh, and what he was saying in one of the, the one of the articles that he wrote was that it's not so, you know. They see a dead person there, then you know they're they're just going after what he left, you know, or what she left, or yeah, you know. Um, in your in your opinion, how important would it be to have printed resources that tell the Lucy Covington story? I'm sorry. Um, in your opinion, um, how important would it be to have resources that tell the Lucy Covington story? I think very important. I, I just, uh, I really can't see, you know, that the leadership of the 20th century, she has got to be up there uh, they talked about great leadership. It was always, she was always in that, always. Mm -hmm. Peter MacDonald, Philip Martin, a whole bunch of, you know, leaders of, that came up uh, in the 20th century. And I can't think of one uh, that would be considered a greater leader than she was, and that was that was recognized. That she was always brought up. That uh, so you are asked how important it would be to have educational resources. Yes, um, I know we we talked about that with. Um, you know, like Martin Trahant, or I'll tell somebody what project I'm working on, and they say, is there going to be a book? You know, is there going to be information that will be available to help educate? There's no book on her. There isn't. There's just a few chapters that have been written, but yeah. not much. No book on her. Not yet. Yeah. Um, and just the video, the, the Encyclopedia Botanica video. Yeah. So, uh, are there other tribal leaders that should be part of the Lucy Covington Center once it's built? Be featured in it, or? All my experience with NCAI, the Northwest was just packed with <laughs> leaders. It's it's really difficult. I, I've been working with uh, another person uh, on a book about the National Tribal Chairman Association, and I haven't read it yet. But I did a, a lot of the, uh, uh, you know, reading, fact checking, and stuff. Uh, and uh, another on, uh, well, this guy's doing the National Congress of American Indians now. And there's never a book been done on them, really. Well, there's one, but that was in the early years. I guess, I don't know, it seems a I'm surprised that there's not a, one done on Lucy. Yeah, I know. Well, do you think that your work could lead up to one or? I, I think so. I'm, I'm not certain if I would be the one that would write it or there would be another, but there's, um, we've gotten some, um, you know, like this is, this is sort of an annotated bibliography of Lucy and her times. Uh -huh. So it's, it sort of um, covers sort of the period. You know, a does. beautiful picture. One day she was telling us about her family and, and stuff like that, and about her uh, 
parents not being able to understand each other or something, you know. Do you have extra copies of that, or? Um, I can probably leave this one with you because I can print it out again. Oh, okay. Awesome. Thank you. It's, yeah. uh, it's got a little smudges on it, but that would probably be a good way to sort of see what she's done. And it does have sort of the timeline talking about her, her, um, you know, her life. Yeah. Where she was born, who her father was, who she was married to. Um, she, you know, she, when she got elected, she was she was actually filling the position that my grandfather had, oh. was George Freelander. So he he was getting hit with diabetes pretty hard. It was impacting him and his health, and so. He said, well, you've been doing this kind of work, you know, and it's time now for you to step up. Do you want to run in my place? And so that's what she did. Oh, okay. So that's how she got elected. And, um, anyway, that, that newsletter, it's just a 1970 created newspaper, Our Heritage. And they just have a time when she was at a conference at WSU with Melton Askett, when she testified before the House of Representatives that she and Mel were in a film, The American Indian, The Quiet Revolution. And then that she was in the film in 1978 on, on uh, produced by Encyclopedia Britannica. And just that she testified in 1979, 1980, and that she passed in 1982. So that they have just, they've done a pretty thorough research of her. And then they do show the article that you did in the Co in Lakota Country Times on October 6, 2010. Oh. oh. So that's in here. Um, Lucy Covington, Termination, Dragon Slayer. Oh, so, yeah. So, I saw that. Yeah. So it, it shows you with a copy of the newspaper, too, in the picture. So. Um. Are there any pictures or images of Lucy that that you recall that should be a part of this collection of work? No, I, I have a, a file which I couldn't find. <clears throat> and I have a picture, I don't know where I got it, of her uh, headstone. She's Catholic, huh? Yeah. I didn't realize that. She was always um, pretty involved with the church, but oh. um, Lucy sort of, I don't know if this is just the family tradition, how it was, but um, she was picked by her grandmother to sort of stay with her often. And grandmothers would do that. They might pick a grandchild out. Oh. Sort of like be your sort of, um, your closest sort of ally or helper. And so she was, she had that honor for her grandma Mary, Mary Moses, who was married to Chief Moses. And she lived to, to be, I think, in, in her, almost in her hundreds. But Lucy would help her and, and assist her all the time. <coughs> what tribe was Moses? They were the Columbia um, Sinkius band, that's what they were called. What's Moses Columbia band today? So they had sort of dominion around the Columbia Basin, um, down through Wenatchee, over into almost like to Pullman and Moscow, and um, Lewiston area up to Spokane, and, and you know sort of up north to um, all along sort of the Columbia River. Um, so anyway, so Lucy was was Mary's sort of handpicked person. And then um, Lucy had, because she didn't have children, and she picked different individuals. She had a, a young gal who helped with her quite a bit. And then she left, she got married, um, and um, I'm forgetting her, her first name. Gladys was her name. And then when Gladys was older, then she wanted my sister Jennifer to be sort of her, her ally, buddy. 
So Jennifer, who's a year younger, was sort of that. She would stay with Lucy during the summertime and help her out and oh. do errands and chores. And um, it was kind of nice because Lucy didn't have very much land, but when she passed, then she passed on. Yeah, how many cattle did she have? Gosh, I think she probably had about 40 or 50 cattle. Oh, okay. So she didn't have a lot after the termination era because she'd have to sell them for her travel. Yeah. Time, but um, the ranch was pretty substantial, and so my aunt Barbara inherited that. And this Saturday, Barb's having, she's 87 now herself, but she's having um, Thanksgiving dinner with, for the family, so we're all supposed to show up and be there. So that'll be nice. Um, and she's, the, she's my godmother, Barb is, but she's the one who inherited most everything. Yeah. And um, <coughs> when Lucy passed away, um, she had two Cadillacs. She liked driving Cadillacs. Oh, uh -huh. so she gave she gave one of them to Mel. So Mel has a, a really nice white Cadillac. <laughs> I don't know if he still has it or not, but, but we always remember thinking he really lucked out. <laughs> so, <coughs> 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 I wanted to ask you some questions about NSAI, and um, sure. did NSAI, did they, I know they, they tended to do like memorials to Native people, to the leadership, um, they still do that, they recognize and honor those who passed on in their different years, and so um, was that something that you helped to start in the organization? Uh, no, it was kind of, uh, uh, it was... They, they were doing that when I first came into NCAI. But usually it was somebody that died that immediate year, you know, if mm -hmm. our conventions were in the fall and if anybody died, it, they were uh, memorialized. Were you involved in anything involving Lucy? She died in 82. I was out of NCAI quite a bit, or 78 to 82, four years, so. Uh, sometimes NCAI was strange. People who replaced you sometimes didn't want your spirit around, you know, or something. So, uh, at times, you'd get bad mouth, or yeah. they'd leave you out of things and stuff like that. And so, you know, it's, but by that time, too, I was pretty busy doing other things, you know, so. Yeah. I, I hear you on that. When I was, uh, for, I, I became the executive director for the National Indian Health Board. Yeah. And that was for eight years from 95 till 2002. And, um, and I know after I left, I mean, there were certain things I thought I put into place because they didn't really have, they had a consumer conference, but they, they didn't really have a, they, they, had, they had their annual conference, but they didn't have any, any, sort of honor or recognition that they gave to their managers or their prominent tribal leaders or health advocates. So we, we decided as a part of the consumer conference to recognize and have a banquet to honor people from Indian country. Because Indian Health Service is really good at giving all these awards and yeah. mostly for the Commission Corps officers, but they don't necessarily recognize the tribes. And because the tribes were all about 50%, 638, we, we said, well, we have to recognize the tribe somehow because some of them are really making some substantial public health efforts at improving health care. So we, we sort of in, um, instituted the, um, their, their annual banquet and the recognition, but we needed to highlight and recognize somebody. So we said, well, let's, let's give a Lifetime Achievement Award to someone like Jake, and call it the Jake White Crow Award because Jake was such a long director for NCAI, and I worked for him as an intern, so I thought that would be a good, not NCAI, but NIHB, that that would be a good person to 
name you the Lifetime Achievement Award after. So it's, it's it was something I, I set up. And the uh -huh. nice thing is this year they gave the recognition to my brother Andy for his, oh. his work in advocacy. So, uh, Who was it that was head of IHS for so many years? Everett Rhodes? No, before him. That's who it was, yeah. Was he there when you were executive director? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was a long time then. Yeah. So, he was pretty interesting. He would have a, a meeting at his house um, for all the budget people, for the people who were, who were making recommendations for the next annual budget. So we had instituted, um, it, it, they had what they call, um, they had a budget process that was sort of like supporting OMB, and they would give recommendations to OMB by the end of November for the upcoming budget. Mm -hmm. So, um, but most of it was really at that time oriented just to Indian health and not to the tribes that were 638ed. So, when, when I was there, we initiated the budget um, um, formulation committee, and we said we should take this and have all of the areas create their own budget recommendations, but we should be steering the process and telling the Indian Health Service that's how the budget should be shaped. So we sort of took that process over, because it used to be really run by the feds instead of the tribes. Uh -huh. So anyway, that was one of my recommendations, and it's still in place, so I'm pretty happy about that. Um, but that's, like you said, behind the scenes, do what we can to change it mm -hmm. internally. Did Emory Johnson start the uh, Indian Health Board? Um, I think he worked closely with, there was a gentleman from um, Florida, he was one of those really prominent tribal leaders, but tribal sort of health administrators. And I want to, it's not sure, but I can't remember what his name was. He's one of the original um, board members that incorporated NIHB. Oh. Tommy, Howard Tommy. Yeah. Remember him? He disappeared. He sort of did, but I think. He was the guy behind all of the success of the Seminole Casinos. That's what I always thought, too, yeah. And yeah, I, I just thought he disappeared, you know, and you didn't see, see him anymore. He's probably a lot like Warren Buffett. <laughs> <laughs> kind of behind the scenes. Yeah. Howard Tom, yeah, I remember you. But, you know, I mean, they own Planet Hollywood. I don't know if seen their new casino hotel but yeah it's pretty far out and which tribe owns uh hard rock it's the seminole tribe oh, okay yeah Not, that's yeah it is the okay. hard rock hotel hard yeah rock in planet hollywood so, yeah yeah they're um i'm certain howard tommy was behind a lot of that mm -hmm. i mean James Billy is the person who's got yeah. sort of most of the notoriety around it all. Yeah. Because he was sort of notorious. But um, Howard Tommy, I think, was really behind James Billy. Uh -huh. so it's, I, he I, worked I, kind of silently, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> I think he's since passed on, I think, but I'm not certain. Uh -huh. I'd have to check. But um, a friend of mine was, is such, her uncle was one of their, their leading attorneys, and that was, um, his last name is Shore, James Shore. Hmm. And I don't know if, I mean, it's just almost like the, um, kind of like a mafia story in a way. <laughs> he was a, he was Consigliere. A, he, yeah, he was sort of that way, but he was blind, and he worked from home, and he always had to have help. Uh -huh. You know, because he's blind, so he had people who were helping him. But um, in the '90s, he was shot upon. I mean, his his home was he was at home in 
somebody came along and was trying to shoot him because I think yeah. they thought he knew too much information or something. Mm. Anyway, it's just that's why I say it's kind of almost like mobster like, but it's not how all the tribe yeah. was operated, it's just a certain facet of the tribe. Mm. And um, he was always above board and always very honest and very, mm. very dedicated to his community. National Indian Health Board was an interesting group to work with. But I was in Denver, and we were in our 30th year, and they wanted to move um, the whole operation. We had I started out with three staff, and when I left, there were 12. Yeah. But they wanted to move all 12 of us to Washington, and I didn't want to go back. I was determined not to go back, because my kids were too young, and I just didn't want them to have to, to be back there. That was when the war was starting in Iraq. <laughs> I understand what you're saying about being the CEO for an organization. <laughs> Pardon? When you're the, the, lead, the lead executive of an organization and then you leave and they, they're not necessarily going to support your... Right, yeah. Your, they want to clean your fingerprints off everything. Right, right. <laughs> anyway. Well, I tell you what, I'm getting... Hungry? No, uh... I've, I've been ailing, so it's just, uh, I'm very un, uncomfortable, hard to uh -huh. discomfort, so. Well, I can appreciate that. I'm, da I'm down to the last question. Okay. And it was just, is there anything that you'd like to share? Pardon? Anything else that you would like to share? About Lucy? Yeah. Or if there's a vision that you have of what a center would be. You know, now that uh, you, you don't think of these things for a long time, but as we talk here, so much comes back. And uh, you know, I just, uh, I can't picture any leader in the 20th century as great as Lucy Covington. I just can't. They're, you know, they're uh, the whole influence, the whole spirit, you know, that she uh, left, you know, with everything she did. Uh, that's it. I just, uh, I can't picture a greater person. Can I look into the camera and say that again? <laughs> of course. You're welcome to say whatever you want. I'm sorry. I... No, I, I understand. Yeah, I'm getting old. <laughs> it's, it's hard. It's probably hard to do everything that you used to do. Yeah. So. Hey, can I ask you something? Pardon? Can I ask you something? Yeah. Well, um, so, uh, uh, Yvette, she mentioned that, uh, um, Eastern Washington University wants to build Lucy Covington Center. Yeah. Dedicated to Lucy Covington. Um, was that the first that you heard of that? Yeah. What do you think about that? How does that make you feel? I think it would be very appropriate. You know, it, uh, it, it stands for a whole bunch of things. First of all, Indian leadership, Indian women leadership, which is very important. And uh, just greatness, you know, and I couldn't picture 
I don't know what the politics up there is of anybody objecting to it. Do. I think it would be a great idea. I was... remember Joe Delacruz very well and all the... I like the Northwest. They, they, they really produced a lot of great leaders. I didn't know Billy Frank very well. And see, I wasn't involved in the fissions and stuff like that. And uh, and if it uh, were, it was before my time, so. Uh, I know Ramona Bennett, you know. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, that big report done by 11,000 great scientists around the world and another one that was done by 40 great scientists in this country and Donald Trump says I looked at it but I don't believe it you know and you can say that but that's very selfish because what you should be doing is you know how that's going to affect everything from here, you know. All those farmers that were out here in these fields up to their ass in water and their fields are not gonna ever grow a crop again. Uh, that's, that's gonna be the new normal. It'll come back in a year, it'll, you know, and, and uh, yet this man doesn't want to recognize it so they don't plan for any levees. They don't plan for seawalls. You know, New York City's going to be... <laughs> and uh, it's just, it's awful. It's totally irresponsible, you know, to just flake it off and say, I don't believe it, you know, so. We're not going to do anything about it. Well, thank you. We appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to keep you, keep you too long.